Hello everyone, and today we're going to begin an exploration of one of the most important intellectuals who ever lived, one of my favorite philosophers, we could call him a philosopher, and a gentleman who everybody who wants to try to understand the current malaise of the West and of modernity ought to read, and that is Ibn Khaldun and his great masterpiece, the Machidima. Um, this lecture, this talk, will be more of a brief summary introduction of the scope of the work, also provide some background uh, to the man, before uh, future lectures explore in more specificity and detail uh, some of the highlights that we're going to whet our appetites with, so to speak, in this brief introduction. So Ibn Khaldun's Makhidama is the introduction to his seven-volume history of the Arab and Berber people, and in fact, history of the world up to his time and fr from what he knew of the world via sources and traveling. The Kitab Al-Ibir is the full name of the whole text, but it is his lengthy three-volume introduction, the al makhidama that is fondly remembered by scholars of many stripes, sociologists, philosophers, political theorists, economists, historians, and uh, historiographers. Uh, Ibn Khaldun is sometimes considered much like uh, Thucydides, an objective historian, but anybody who's really read Thucydides in any detail, especially from a philosophy background, would know that Thucydides isn't really an objective so-called scientific historian. Anybody who has also studied history and historiography uh, might be skeptical that such an enterprise can even exist. Uh, others would say that uh, Ibn Khaldun is a sociologist, uh, a political theorist. Uh, he is a historian, he is a sociologist, he is a political theorist. Uh, reasons why everybody in those disciplines do gravitate to him. But in, in the most consequential sense, Ibn Khaldun is the first systematic philosopher of history. So he provides, at least in the introduction, the so-called laws to how history works. And so he gives us a philosophy of history, a history of rise and fall, a history of cycles, a history of growth, stasis, decline, death, and rebirth. So anybody who has read uh, Gian Battista Vico or Oswald Spengler would already be familiar with these ideas, but Ibn Khaldun uh, wrote them 500 years before Oswald Spangler and roughly 300, 350 years before uh, Vico. So Ibn Khaldun lived in turbulent times. Cordoba had fallen to the Christian Iberians, who would eventually become, form the, uh, uh, the Spanish kingdom once the Reconquista was complete. The once great and mighty Islamic State in Iberia had been reduced to the Emirate of Granada. North Africa was fracturing and falling victim to Christian Crusades, with Islamic rulers often allying with the Christian Crusaders for their own self-gain and interests. The Abbasid Caliphate had fallen in the Middle East. The Mongols and their successors, the Timurids, were invading the Levant and the Black Plague had struck the Middle East. We often forget that the Black Plague also hit the Middle East and North Africa, though not as consequential as in Europe. The world that Ibn Khaldun read about and lived in was not the world he was uh, always experiencing. The world he had read about before his times was a world of flourishing. However, the world that he was immediately experiencing and the works that he was reading from uh, immediate uh, and concrete sources of the time painted a different picture. So Ibn Khaldun 
wanted to understand why the world he was living in and why the intellectuals and the writers of his time were producing works and living through times that were vastly different from the golden age of Islam or the golden age of Greece, of Athens, uh, the, uh, the Greek philosophers, although they were generally pushed a little bit off to the side now following Al-Ghazali's critique of the Greek philosophers. Nevertheless, the Greek philosophers were still being studied in Ibn Khaldun's time. So Ibn Khaldun's world was one of chaos and tragedy, which should never be lost to any reader of his work. He could be, in more modern parlance, classified as a realist. The Makitama serves several purposes. First was a so-called scientific approach to history, where Ibn Khaldun sought to explain events and the human condition from uh, purely naturalistic means. The first book of the Makitama describes this in some detail concerning the relationship of geography and environment upon human civilization and races. Though a bit boring and dry, his outlining of the role of environment, what scientists would call today environmental conditioning, is going to become a present and prescient theme in other sections of the work. Second was the attempt to understand why great civilizations all seem to fall. The great biblical civilizations had risen and fallen, Persia, Persia, Greece, Rome, and now it seemed like the great Arab Muslim civilization was on the cusp of falling as well. Thus, Ibn Khaldun sought to understand why civilizations experience a life cycle of formation, growth, stagnation, and eventual decline. Third, and this is related to the second purpose, is that he sought to understand what was happening from Muslim eyes. So those who think that the work is purely secular or has no theological or religious impulses miss this critical third point. Ibn Khaldun was, after all, a fairly devout Muslim, and he had intimate contacts uh, and relations with Sufis during his lifetime. Though the work pretends to be scientific, it is also motivated from a man who was a sincere Sunni, wondering why the promises of success and safety to God's people seem not to be coming true in his lifetime. Ibn Khaldun's exploration of civilization has been the focus of scholars since the work's publication. He follows the ancient political philosophers in understanding uh, humans as political animals. That means social animals. Humans are not, as the so-called Enlightenment philosophers came to think, e.g. Hobbes, Locke, Spinoza, and Rousseau, uh, solitary, separated, atomized individuals who were only pragmatically who only pragmatically placed themselves into society to avoid the brutal life of the state of nature or have been forced into society by the dictates of the powerful. Instead, Ibn Khaldun takes the classical view that humans are naturally social, which means they are naturally political. Political in classical Greek philosophy, rooted in the word polis, meaning city, entails how to organize a body. People are members of a body, and a body needs to be organized. From this, Ibn Khaldun maintains that filial bonds are the primary roots of one's political animus. In a harsh world, family is the refuge for justice, because there is no natural justice in the world. He says that it is natural to feel affection for one's family, an extended family, and that this serves uh, as the root in our nature uh, that causes us to seek and defend family members from harm. From this root of asabiya, or group feeling, in the Rosenthal translation, which is alternatively called group solidarity in other explanations, is the core of the political. Asabiya, 
is the wellspring of civilization. It is what unites people and gives them a warlike and sacrificial character in which members are willing to die for others for the continuity of the tribe. Westerners may be more familiar with, the idea, with this idea as the esprit de corps, love of kith and kin, which provides the fighting spirit of a community. This way of life comes from rural geography, where life is harsh and people banded together to survive, though they do not live a life of luxury, but a life of basic necessity. Here we return to the impact of geography on politics, environmental conditioning. Thus, Ibn Khaldun offers an in-depth and penetrating philosophy of geopolitics in his work. Cities do not fall from heaven and represent the start of civilization. Instead, civilization emerges from the margins. Civilization has its roots in the rural regions where the tribe first emerged from and where life was harsh and brutal, where beasts and other tribes constantly threaten one's survival. As Ibn Khaldun says, aggressiveness is natural in living beings, and that includes humans. It is a stark picture that is like the ancient Catholic Augustinian portrait of man. Man, it, man is a sinful and domineering creature. It is because the rural way of life fosters a spirit of aggressive love for one's kith and kin that the rural person is courageous. In this sense, and in this sense alone, the rural dweller, Bedouin in Ibn Khaldun's specific language, is closer to goodness than any than the other types of humans, e.g. urban dwellers. This is because people who live in cities are self-centered and self-enamored. They only care about themselves in their pursuit of luxurious and pleasurable living. The city turns people into self-seeking pleasure animals. We might call those people today hedonists. This leads to paradoxes, however, about human civilization. Ibn Khaldun does not apologize for the rural way, so to speak. Urban civilization is grander and superior to rural civilization because it is intricate and refined. The city has libraries, universities, public monuments, great ports, refined clothing and cuisine, paved roads, great cathedrals and mosques. The rural town or tent encampment of the Bedouins, has little in comparison and is defined by its simplicity and savagery. That said, the irony of this is the city is doomed to fail because of its self-centered atomism. Returning to the notion of Asabiya here, Ibn Khaldun contrasts urban and rural life in a dialectic of conflict. The rural people still retain a strong sense of group solidarity. The urban people, over time, because of their luxurious living, become lazy and soft. They lose group consciousness, which, as Ibn Khaldun then remarks, becomes useless. This represents the beginning of internal division of the nation, urban versus rural, rich versus poor. Enlighten versus back, backward, coastal versus interior, tropes we are all familiar with today. Ibn Khaldun's success suggests that two outcomes are possible. The rural people lead a revival of the old ways which injects temporary, temporary life into the nation that gives it extra legs, or an outside group that is more savage, committed to group solidarity, arises and overtakes the decadent and weakened nation that has torn itself apart by internal division. Neither outcome is ideal because Ibn Khaldun doesn't celebrate ancient ways and customs as God's revelation to the world, but he understands the importance of ancient ways and customs in fostering asabiya and identity that is necessary for a nation to survive. However, even if that revival takes place, the decline and fall of the nation is still going to happen. 
It is merely a temporary stopgap, a brief renaissance, if you will, before the inevitable law of decline and death actualizes itself. So in this sense, Ibn Khaldun doesn't think that decline and death is necessarily always fixed. The movement to decline and death can be remedied for a brief temporary period of time for a respite. He goes into detail in some policy prescriptions how governments and states can also uh, enact policies that could prevent for a temporary period this decline into death. He suggests, for instance, that you can cut taxes, promote businesses, inculcate uh, civic virtue through policy programs as well. Religion, of course, religious revival and a revival of group identity are the most central uh, ways that you can avoid immediate decline. But in the end, even if you achieve these temporary respites, these temporary uh, renaissances of religion, group identity, and uh, material vigor, nevertheless, over time, uh, that revival will dissipate and you will eventually uh, end up in decline and death. In the midst of this commentary, we can also identify traces of historical circumstances that he was familiar with. He remarks that nations rarely last when they rule over a multitude of people of different cultures, languages, and religions. Look at the Cordoba Caliphate, that grandest of the Islamic Caliphate that ruled over Muslims, Christians, Jews, Arab speakers, Latin speakers, uh, the various Romance, Spanish language, uh, Hebrew speakers, and various, again, various Iberian-speaking peoples. For all its grandeur, it collapsed because there could be, um, there could not be enough group solidarity. Ibn Khaldun recognizes the problem of a fifth column in a nation. But group solidarity is not something entirely benign either. As the tribe expands from its rural enclaves and grows into a modern and large civilizational polity, there comes a point when marriage into the family isn't enough to foster group solidarity as it was in times past. This is when tribes turn to propaganda, Ibn Khaldun tells us. In Ibn Khaldun's time, the most obvious form of propaganda was religion, although Ibn Khaldun doesn't suggest by religion being propaganda that religion is wholly false. Again, he is a devout Muslim, but he recognizes that religion gets wielded for propaganda purposes. Religion becomes the new blood identity of the people. We are Muslims, or we are Christians, rather than we are the McDonald tribe, or, um, you know, the Berber tribe, or whatever specific closed, limited tribe of blood was the essence of group solidarity in the formation of the political. Now religion comes to serve as that marker of group identity, which can unite a multitude of people. In more modern times, we can see this through new forms of identity politics or ideology. We are liberals or we are humanists, etc. At the same time as all, all of this is occurring, he gives commentary over political economy as well. Ibn Khaldun laid out the theory of supply and demand, the division of labor and taxation, all of which is uh, foundational to uh, modern classical economic theory. One of the more haunting insights, perhaps for Americans especially, is how the start of civilization has low tax rates, but the revenues are high because productivity is high and there is a great willingness for its citizens to sacrifice. At the collapse of a civilization, the tax rates spike, revenue drops, economic productivity stagnates, military production and protection is outsourced, which demands higher taxes. 
and the military is also enlarged to try and defend its land, which leads to higher taxes. When Ibn Khaldun says that military protection is outsourced, what he is saying is rather than draw up from the national community uh, at the end of empires, uh, military forces are mercenary. Or if we look at today, uh, military groups are privatized, uh, private outsourcing of military uh, expenditure, uh, protection, and uh, military forces. Additionally, and very thought-provokingly, Ibn Khaldun also says that urban people are really oppressed despite thinking otherwise. The rise of city demands a rise in state power and the creation of a political apparatus because people, quote, entrust their property and lives to governors, end quote. People in the city reject taking res responsibility for themselves and push it off to what becomes the political class, which then forms the true political dynasties of all nations. Thus, the paradox of the city is that it leads to the Leviathan because people do not take responsibility for themselves and their families. They again entrust their property and lives to governors. As Khaldun notes, people subject themselves to the laws and regulations of the city which manages the lives and property of the people, which is what they wanted in order to pursue their lives of luxury and hedonism. Meanwhile, the rural people remain outside the subject of city politics and are freer because they are self-resilient and reliant, rather than turn... Uh, to family and social networks, people in the city turn to the state to provide their needs and solve their problem. In the rural areas, people turn to family and the mosque or the church uh, to help resolve their problems, which prevent the rise of state power to do this. This is why the growth of civilization leads to the expansion of political bureaucracy increased taxes, and eventually a stagnation and decline of economics. Again, where does political bureaucracy flourish? It flourishes in the cities. Bureaucracy is rarely seen in rural communities. What is the vitalistic force of rural communities? It is family. It is the community itself. It is the local mosque or the church that people go to. What is the central focus and the central uh, pulsating heart in the city. It is the bureaucratic institutions. Furthermore, Khaldun says that urban dwellers are unwilling to make sacrifices because they have grown custom to a life of pleasure and luxury. Rural people are still willing to make sacrifices because they live a life of daily sacrifice. They don't have luxurious goods, they are not used to eating multiple meals a day. They aren't used to being fat cats, in other words. This only furthers, furthers the division between, between rural savages and urban cosmopolitans. This includes how political classes rule. The dynasty, which traces its origins back to an original founding father, so to speak, and embodied the ethos of Asabia many generations ago, suddenly seeks its own luxur luxury politics. Suddenly, politics turns not to how to organize and direct a body, but how to organize and best actualize the use of luxury. The dynasty becomes concerned with holding on to its wealth and goods and rejects helping others. It rejects its bonds to the people, to its citizenry, especially the poor and rural people, who then grow resentful toward their rulers for having abandoned them. In the end, the law of the jungle prevails. All civilizations are destined to collapse, and the cycle of the rise and decline of civilization starts anew. Ibn Khaldun offers much in the Makudama, cultural criticism, notes on political economy, class conflict, geopolitics, irony, and a tragic picture that is that even though civilizations are destined 
to, uh, to fail, humans have no other option because their very nature compels them to the political than to engage in civilizational building even though the civilization will not last. Those who have read Oswald Spengler ought to read Ibn Khaldun, who beat him to the observation of the cyclical nature of the rise and fall of civilizations 500 years earlier than he. Ibn Khaldun is also prescient in identifying what I see as grand commentary and explanation for understanding the current malaise of the United States and the broader Western, especially Western European world. His identification of rural and coastal resentment of the politics between the urban and the uh, interior or the rural, the politics between rich and poor, the politics of group resentment, all are prescient for us today. And so this concludes a basic summary overview of the highlights of Ibn Khaldun's Lachidama. We will return in other lectures to examine some of the central and specific uh, focuses of his work, uh, namely the notion of Asabiya. We will also look at his geopolitical and geographic dialectic, and we will also look at political economy, bureaucracy, and how all of this ties into the rise and fall of civilization. Thank you.